joining us today. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Simohak. Dr. Simohak has over 25 years of experience treating adults, families, adolescents, and couples. She is a specialist in treating severe trauma through an existentialist approach. Dr. Simohak has also specializes in depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and psychotic disorders. She is a published author who has presented her research on group psychotherapy nationally and internationally. Dr. Simohak is also a licensed massage therapist who practices mind-body work. She is an advocate for individuals and families who struggle with the stigma associated with severe mental health disorders. Dr. Simohak is an eclectically oriented therapist who uses a variety of orientations, including ACT and DBT, psychodynamic psychotherapy, couples and family therapy, humanistic and cognitive behavioral techniques. She believes in an approach that is biopsychosocial and she works with the whole person, which at times or probably often includes the family. Dr. Simohak is one of 4% of all psychologists who is board certified in clinical psychology. She has authored a few books, including The Interactive World of Severe Mental Illness, um, Group Dynamics, and Group Therapy for Adults with Severe Mental Illness. So, Dr. Simohak, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, I'm really, uh, I'm really excited for this conversation. Yeah. Can we kind of just get started with... Um, you know, I gave an introduction, but can you fill us in on, give us a little bit about yourself and what got you interested in studying and learning more about psychology? Well, um, I would say that I was initiated in the womb. So literally I grew up with a mother with a depression and a psychosis, depressed oh. psychosis. So I learned the language of psychosis very early um, mm. in my very benevolent, not malevolent mother's arms. And um, uh, I became very keenly aware of issues like stigmatization and scapegoating as I evolved into um, more, um, trying to think, less concrete, more critical thinking at around the age of 12 and 13. And then mm. knew somehow um, I would venture into psychology. However, that was not my first step. I, I, I landed in the world of ballet um, and body and movement and authentic movement, um, which led me to Northwestern University's School of Theater and then later on to Medill School of Journalism for a graduate degree. And I was um, in the ad world. I was a mad woman until the age of 28. And then I decided existentially after a dream about Prometheus Unbound, I needed to go back to school and pursue my doctorate. So that's my initial apprenticeship into um, psychology. It all fit together very well. Um, and I was immediately interested in severe mental illness. Just, it was the place to go, the uncomfortable. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. Can I ask, did, did your mom uh, ever like heal from that? Did she struggle with yes, that throughout she life? She became a banker. She got on the right. Oh, wow. and she became a banker, but she had a third eye. And I remember hmm. telling her that that was a chakra point. And uh -huh. um, of course, in the West, I, I really truly think she may have been more of a visionary. If you look at hmm. the work of um, uh, some of the, uh, oh, Joseph Campbell that you know there's oh. there's psychoses that are 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 dreadful and damaging and then there are psychoses that are more in the area of visionary and i think mm. that's probably where she was because as we oh, know in okay. hinduism the third eye is a chakra uh-huh so, very interesting yeah she was very yeah. gifted let's say uh, um kind of the question i think that psychoses can mean different things or different people have ideas about it is it okay if i ask like kind of what along where did her psychosis fall like you said visionary but what did that look like um well i uh, i would say she had uh visual hallucinations which is pretty unusual if they're not mm. triggered by um some sort of drug-induced psychosis um and obviously 
a delusion that if she looked at someone with her third eye, she could kill them, which was not a good thing okay. to live with. Yeah. You know, and I kind of ameliorated that a little bit as I grew into my teens and um, became more developed as a thinker. And she and I were able to talk that through a bit. But it really wasn't until the 1980s, my family was in Vienna. She, um, we were, my brother and I were in Freud's office, believe it or not. My parents were down the street in a bar and my mother had another breakdown and we had to get through that whole trip. And we got back and she was hospitalized for six weeks and some innovative new um, uh, medications were introduced that really changed her life. Hmm. Um, starting with Prozac, actually, fluoxetine. Oh, okay. And then repetitive yeah. thinking and then Risperdal. And it made a big difference. Yeah. And good. Yeah, well, I'm sure you. She got good psychotherapy. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah, I'm sure you were uh, introduced to a, like stigma and what that looks like mm -hmm. for people, especially people with severe mental illness and um, at a very young age that I'm sure that was really difficult to deal with, especially with not just like a friend, but your mother, you know? Yes. Yeah. I, I became a fighter. <laughs> <Let's> just... uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't like stigma. I don't like mm -hmm. um, any belief system that would limit anyone with a um, myth of mental illness says mm -hmm. um, people do exist in severe states of pain, um, but some individuals, and we might call that mental illness because we have to give them a diagnosis so the medical companies get money. But uh -huh. I also think many of these disorders are altered states of consciousness, which mm. lead us to potentially grow, believe it or mm. not, and investigate the unconscious and have what we call a positive disintegration. We disintegrate into depression, but we come out a much more cohesive, much more binocular individual. So hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. 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 I um uh, I I I have heard about, you know, kind of like an analogy of our body is self-healing. Like if you get a cut or a you know a wound, it tries to heal itself, yes. but then let's say you have an infection because there's dirt or something in the wound. Mm -hmm. The infection is not a bad thing. It's not a disorder. Yeah. It's trying to tell you like, hey, there's something that needs to be looked at here and cleaned up. Would you take that same approach to like our psychological well-being? Yeah, I, I would also um, uh, ignore the um, Descartian mind-body split. We are one. So mm, okay. the body is moving towards homeostasis. Um, in the West, we want to cut it out. We want to name it, label it, diagnose it. And in many instances, we fail to understand it. Uh -huh. So um, the body never lies. Alice mm -hmm. Miller, um, I anything that manifests in the body is largely linked also to mental processes. Mm -hmm. so it's really fascinating yeah. stuff. I recently read the book, The Body Keeps the Score. That's what it makes That's me think of too. very good yeah. one, yeah. It's like the the things that we don't speak about, it's gonna show up somewhere, huh? Oh, absolutely. Um, it will oh. manifest in the body. Um, I'd also really push the book, um, The Shaman Body by Arnold Mindel oh. right now. He Shaman. wrote the famous book, Coma. He's a quantum physicist. Okay. And oh. really, we're talking a lot about altered states in a lot of these disorders. Mm -hmm. It's very uh, shaman body. I'll remember that. I'll put it. I'll put it in the link too. So okay. if anyone wants to check it, yeah. Um, talking about the body, and you talking about how you were, you did theater. Mm -hmm. um, I know in the body keeps the score. He even recommends theater. Uh, mm -hmm. He recommends like yoga, different mm -hmm. things to get in touch with the body and. Mm -hmm. I recently heard about sensory motor psychotherapy where it's, mm -hmm. they look at like posture and what your body. So can you talk a little bit about, yeah, your experience with the theater body. and involved? Yeah. The body. Well, yeah. I think um, my, uh, I, I was very kinesthetically, and I'll say in quotes, gifted as a ballet dancer. Uh -huh. So I was very in tune with my body later as a mime kind of individual 
practice that for fun at Northwestern. Um, I got in touch with um, Hakomi, which is a form of body therapy. Uh, so I was already kinesthetically aware and went to school specifically because of my Hakomi experience, which links to some of the work of Eugene Genlin, which he was a protege of Carl Rogers. And what uh -huh. Genlin said was, go into the body. What is the felt sense of the matter? And in Hakomi, it takes it a step further. You go into the body, but you may actually even touch the body, move the body, go with the body. Um, good example might be I had a client, the occipital lobes here. You know, when you're a baby, you are supported. And she would be like this in sessions. And I said, may I, I'm a licensed person, so I can... I got massage therapist, so I literally pushed her head up and she mm. went, that gesture stimulated a memory of her father's wow. suicide when she was three mm. months old. And mm. it led to an unraveling of information that led me and her to come to the realization she blamed herself for the suicide. Wow. So, you know, the body never lies. Yeah. Likewise, we as therapists can get feeling states, like shamanistic feeling states from our clients. Mm. That's a whole other thing. So I'm not sure I answered your question. Uh, no, that's uh, you. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned earlier that you had a dream that led you to the decision to further pursue. Yes. yes. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Well, at the time, I was a copywriter for J. Walter Thompson in the world of ad men, only I was an ad woman in the 1980s, <laughs> and I um, doing the New York thing and all that stuff, and the Hamptons, and I found it absolutely meaningless, although it fit very well into my life in the ultimate end. And I was at a conference in Florida, and I woke up in a cold sweat, and mm. I was Prometheus, as we know, the Greek Prometheus his eyes are pecked out by hmm. birds and I had to be unbound. And at that hmm. moment, I have the dream upstairs. I'm working on a book and I'm going to use that dream. Um, huh. And at that point, I just knew I had, to, I had to make a serious move or that would be it. So I became huh. Prometheus unbound. It's a trilogy. Huh. They lost, huh, okay. but it's a trilogy. Prometheus <laughs> unbound, Prometheus unbound. So that really was a quite a visceral dream uh, that led me a uh, very, very powerful dream hmm. that moved me yeah. Yeah. to change. I can uh, just already with some of your stories and like the way you think about things, um, cause I'm very interested in like, uh, Carl Jung, and I know that you have done Jungian analysis yourself um, or been through analysis. Um, mm -hmm. I can see like why that would be so attractive to you with the way that you think about things and that way. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, yeah. Can you tell us how you got into Carl Jung and like um, why you decided to go through analysis and things like that? Um, probably at around the age of 25, which would be way too young for the actual Carl Jung to accept anyone as an analysand. Um, mm. I started with a therapist and um, that individual I was with for two or three years and oh. did a lot of searching work around career um, and probably led me to that dream. Um, oh. From that individual, I went to a therapist by the name of Shirley Fontenot uh, who's now retired, hopefully not deceased, but um, I became very involved with the body and the meaning of body sensations, altered states of consciousness. And from there, I went on to work with Kenneth James for now 25 years, um, wow. still regularly meet for self-discovery. And it's been all of the, the 
the idea that there's more than just an individual unconscious, but a collective unconscious that's rich in archetypes and that we don't, we think of causality in the West as a sen- efficient causality for a reaction. There's an opposite and equal reaction, which is uh-huh. really Newtonian physics. If we look into the quantum world, what is our final cause? Aristotle had four different types of causality. And from a Jungian perspective, our final cause is in the big S self, which is an archetype which exists floating around in the collective. So the goal of analysis is to get through our individual unconscious, which is filled with complexes from life, mother complex, inferiority complex, et cetera, et cetera, and to form an ego self axis with the big S self. And then we're in sync. Then we're on the road. At least we go in and out of the road, off the road. But we're, we're, we've got a map, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so did you... So you said you started working with analysis when you were like 25, which was too young, but Carl Jung would have done. Yeah. But did you purposefully seek out a Jungian analyst yeah. at that time? Yeah. And how did you I, know about Carl I Jung? had already read a lot of just preliminary work on Jung, and I oh. knew that I wanted to. I was very cognizant of my dream world, even starting as a very young girl. And oh. I was even aware of altered states of consciousness as a very young girl. <laughs> So I was just kind of led in that direction. Um, Mm -hmm. um, My, the early readings I did on the chalice and the blade and when God was a woman and, you know, all that jazz really um, set me up to go. I I was led there kind of by synchronicity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Very neat. Um, And so at what age did you, you stopped doing, so you had the dream, you stopped being an admin, and you started working toward a career in Well, I took therapy. a very interesting route. I okay. went, I was an ad woman, ad man, uh-huh. throughout uh-huh. most of my degree, while I did my degree, and uh, which I think was very valuable in retrospect, because I'm, obviously, I could write grants, I, I knew how to present, I... I understood the business world, but at the end of my, um, I was able to do everything, my internships, my externships, excuse me. And then upon a very synchronistic event, which allowed me to get my first choice internship at Cook County Jail, which led to a fellowship, I just left the ad agency business completely in a very large salary. Ironically, I had one employee of the year or Gruner and Yar for two years in a row before I left. <laughs> uh, hasta la vista. <laughs> How uh, long? They lost a good worker, yeah. Uh, but why? So it, it makes sense, but why did you specifically choose? So did you go for like, uh, I'm sorry, I should know this. Do you yeah. have your master's doctorate? I have a master's in journalism, a master's in clinical psychology, and a doctorate in clinical psychology. Okay. Did Was the master's in clinical psychology embedded in the doctoral program? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Okay. And then I, I took a year hiatus to study the body, um, okay. which has now become much more complicated than it was when I did it 25 years ago, uh, uh, but it was very worth it. Uh, are you PhD, PsyD? PsyD. So why did you specific, you had the dream, the Prometheus Unbound, and you knew I had to, you had to make a change. Why did you specifically choose Saidi? Um, You know, I, uh, <laughs> I just really fell into it. A, a friend, a dear friend of mine at the time, David Bradley, was at the Chicago School. He was uh-huh. doing dual degrees at University of Chicago in the Chicago School. And he said, I think this is what you should do. You're really more clinical. Um, at the time they were getting APA accreditation. I really didn't know any of what that meant, nor the difference between PsyD or PhD. I just knew at that point I wanted to work with the psychotic process and help people. Hmm. And it worked out very well because at the time, 
at the Illinois School of Professional Psychology, there were some really great thinkers that were teaching in the early days at the Illinois School, um, which gave me a very broad base understanding of psychodynamic psychotherapy, object relations. Um, actually, Clive Hazels, who was a co-author, mentor, friend, um, was at Northwestern, but also taught at the in the program that I received my doctorate in. So huh. we collaborated years later on a lot of projects. Okay. So it's a really good program. Yeah. It's so, it. yeah. Um, being interested in the psychotic process. Uh, so you, you did your internship at the, at a jail mm -hmm. and then did you go immediately from internship to trying to work at a, at like a, a hospital or what was your no, role I, like? I stayed at additional time at the jail to do a full fellowship because okay. I was very interested in, um, the juxtaposition of, of the psychotic state and criminal activity. And I got an opportunity to work with some rather, some really interesting people. I was able to run a Tavistock group there with some of the, the detainees. And I also had the opportunity to make contact with what rare, but psychopathic process. So okay. it was very interesting. And from there, I went on and worked with uh, Maryville, and I was given the most severe residential hall, which hmm. is primarily made up of what they labeled as borderline girls. Of course, you uh, can't even get that diagnosis until you're you're not a girl, if you're an adult. <laughs> um, but there was a lot of severe trauma and neglect in these kids. Uh, uh, um, and then went on to be director of a facility, specifically Winfield Woods, that cared for, we called it the Emerald City on the Hill, unique care of severely mentally ill adults. And then I became a professor at the School of Osteopathic Medicine, which was coincidentally 20 minutes from Winfield. So oh. I set up res I set up a internship program there and externship program so people could learn how to work with the psychotic process. Mm. Which is really lucky. And can you tell us your thoughts on working with the psychotic process? It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I, huh. I, it, the most interesting thing is um, when most people in our society see a psychiatrist, hmm. they're very rarely asked if they hear voices, whose voice do you hear? Uh, and this happened to one of my clients who I did right up in the active, interactive world of severe mental illness as a case, the woman whose abuser never died, um, the psychiatrist, she had been abused by her stepfather for 15 years of her life. Hmm. And obviously she had a mental breakdown after her minister told her that she was at fault for the abuse hmm. um, because she was Eve in the garden at age five. Don't quite get that, but that's psychotic. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not the good kind. Um, so upon her first uh, breakdown, she was hearing the voice of the stepfather. That was never asked. And she was labeled paranoid schizophrenic. Wow. With a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenic. And then later at the age of 40, she started working with me. And we, we rooted out it was complex trauma. Wow. 40 years old. Yeah, 20 years. And how how long had she been in the mental health system until you got to work with her? 20 years. Wow. 20 years. Yeah. And that's criminal, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. But she's, she did launch out of the facility. And for quite a bit of time, I've been gone for a while now, lived oh. a life worth living. So she was okay. able to beyond the abuser, wrote a beautiful poem oh. um, upon, I may be able to find it actually. Anyway, in the poem, she comes out of the cave, like Plato's cave, uh -huh. and everything is 
for color and beautiful. Uh -huh. And she has confidence and is able to walk toward the rainbow and move on. That's so neat. Just preceding that, that home, mm -hmm. there was a dream where all of her abuse incidents came together like a movie uh, and then the poem uh, it was like a liberation for her yeah yeah that's that's interesting that you say that you mentioned the color and the rainbow and i've heard of people who have complex childhood trauma that going through therapy they'll come back and they'll be like i noticed like flowers were different colors. I've never noticed yeah. how many different colors flowers were, or like, I thought that like, just starting to note just the stuff like that, that they, their well, senses are so blunt. It's to. almost like they have these black and white glasses on and now they're taken off. And hmm. so dominated by memories of the trauma that the trauma, hmm. the fog lifts hmm. and they can see hope. They can see hmm. promise. They can, experience tiny bits of joy mm. and that's really cool when that happens yeah going back to the the auditory hallucinations i've i've heard that it's proper to uh check in as in like are the voices coming from within your head or from outside of your head mm -hmm. and that's like a good way to distinguish between if it's actually auditory hallucinations versus something internalized Right. That would you is agree true. with that? I would okay. agree with that. Um, but sometimes a voice could come out of a Kleenex box, uh, I mean, outside of the self. And then, then uh, you really have to get in why, into the idea of why a Kleenex box? Why yeah. outside the self? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, but generally, the hallucinations I've worked with have been internal, mm. auditory hallucinations. Yeah. Okay. And so in working with the psychotic process, so take it a little bit more, I guess, uh, specific, um, there are, so for instance, in the, in the book on the, the interactive world of severe mental illness that we just kind of discussed, mm -hmm. um, there's a quote in there on page 24 that says a person may enter the hospital with a complex, painful psychosocial problem and leave with a biological one that is considered to a large degree outside of the individual's control. Um, although there mm -hmm. may be a limited rushed attempt to address psychosocial concerns in the hospital, the focus is on medication sends the message mm -hmm. that psychosocial concerns are secondary, if relevant at all. Um, mm -hmm. And so kind of keeping like the biomedical lens in mind mm -hmm. uh, and many psychiatrists perhaps um, just think of okay well there's a brain disorder we need to medic with the right medications mm -hmm. and to some degree that's really like your mom was really helped with medications sure. um, yeah so where are you on like the psychotic process and like I guess stand uh, best protocol on treating it well, from the get-go. I, I think medications can make a tremendous difference, mm -hmm. but we have to realize that the external environment can impinge on a person. If you're in a toxic environment, mm -hmm. that's going to change your biochemistry. And okay. so it, there are multiple variables impeding on a person mm -hmm. um, that can contribute to biological changes leading to a psychotic break, mm. as well as a genetic propensity for these kinds of things. Uh -huh. um, but certainly my view of medication is medication is a step. Mm. The next step is understanding the symptoms. Mm. We can't just amputate a symptom without uh -huh. understanding why it, why now, why you, mm. what does it mean? And I think, unfortunately, that gets lost a lot. Uh, can I, uh, that's, you said that so well. Can I read you a, uh, a quote from Freud, actually? Sure. Uh, so yeah. in this, in, I was reading the a general intro to psychoanalysis by Freud. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about um, delusions of jealousy. 
-hmm. And he said, um, he said, when a delusion cannot be dissipated by the facts of reality, it probably does not spring from reality. Where else then does it spring from? Delusions can have the most various contents. Why is the contents of it, in this case, jealousy? What kind of people have delusions, and particularly delusions of jealousy? Now, we should like to listen to the psychiatrist, but he leaves us in the lurch here. Uh, the psychiatrist only considers one of our questions. He will examine the family history of this woman and will perhaps bring us the answer that the kind of people who suffer from delusions are those in whose families similar or different disorders have occurred repeatedly. In other words, this lady has developed a delusion because she had an hereditary predisposition to do so. This is certainly something, but is it all that we want to know? Is it the sole cause of her disease? Does it satisfy us to assume that is that it is unimportant, arbitrary, or inexplicable that one kind of delusion should have been developed instead of another? And he kind of goes on. But that's that's what I love about the psychodynamic way of thinking mm -hmm. about things is that uh, there isn't maybe there maybe there isn't just one answer. And like you said, why these symptoms? Why now? Why to this person? Well, yeah. yeah, and, you know, there are books out there now, um, The Myth of Normalcy, and It Didn't Start With You, that suggests the epidemiological um, transmission of trauma uh, two and three generations back biologically. Uh, and I can't say that paranoia in a third generation genocide survivor doesn't come from... Mm. Uh -huh. The narrative of generations of family that have uh -huh. passed it down genetically. Uh -huh. So this gets very, very complicated. And it's not yeah. so easy just to say, oh, you know, it's just biological. It yeah. is biological, uh -huh. but it's also multi-determined. Hmm. <laughs> very complicated, huh? It is. It is and very complicated, yeah. Uh, we talked a little bit about family therapy. Can you tell us what you believe the role of family therapy to be in treating someone with psychosis? Well, um, uh, my husband, who was until very recently director of the Family and Marital Institute at Northwestern, has given me tremendous insight. I've always been a group person into the family system. I taught family therapy for a number of years and in treating individuals who are psychosis, hmm. um, psychotic, I realized the process is not just in the individual. You can have psychotic sy systems. So hmm. it's not unusual in a family for there to be a designated patient. Uh. And the family does a real good job of keeping that person crazy. Huh. So that none of the members of the family, other than an individual, have to own their own issues. Hmm. So again, this idea that the disorder does not exist independent of the system from which it emerged. Uh -huh. you, you can't really treat uh, that process without looking at the genealogy of a family system and having some family involvement. Not to put you on the spot, but can you give us kind of a case example of a psychotic systems playing out within a family? Um, gosh, yeah. Um, let me think of one. There's so many. Um, yes. let me think of a good one. Um, Well, I think the a good one would be um, um, the last train out of Berlin from the book. So in this case, um, a young family was, the story goes, the history of the family was they were literally on, they were a Jewish family on the last train out of Berlin um, during Nazi Germany. And it, the Nazis at one point said all Jews off the train. Mm. And my client then, a three-month-old baby with bright red hair, got off the train with her parents, obviously. Mm. And a Nazi officer came up to her and said, that, you're a beautiful little girl. 
go back on the train. Hmm. Well, that stuck with her. And what evolved out of that experience was, um, and naturally the parents lost 97% of their family in the war hmm. and, and the Holocaust. So that system that my client grew up in took on almost a concentration camp dynamic. Mm. And she remembered at the age of seven saying, I wished the Nazis would have taken me because wow. as if it's as if they're raising me here in the United States. So mm. that there and then led to her carrying for a number of years, her parents own complicated grieving and uh, really psychotic-like process from a massive loss of family members. And I remember working with her on her mother, with her mother, on her mother, about her mother. And it became very clear after about five years of me saying to her and pointing out, working with her and her mother, that she was carrying a lot of psychopathology for her mother. Now, mm. my client would deny that and deny that and deny that. And then five years into the treatment, she went, you know, I don't want to carry all this psychopathology for my mother. Uh -huh. I did, I, I'd been saying it for five years. She said it herself. <laughs> uh -huh. It's the ego self axis clicked. And mm. at that point, she started to get better okay. because she stopped owning pathology for the family member and put it back. Does that make sense? Yeah. So would you say it's almost like, um, the client felt like because of me, we survived this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And now that we have survived, but 90 something percent of the rest of the family didn't, my parents are carrying this extreme weight. And it's because I, it's because of me that we are here carrying this extreme weight. Well, that's so what she, was what she was led to, I think, internalize that in the way she yeah. was treated by her parents. So almost as if they may have unconsciously blamed her for getting uh -huh. us out of Germany. And now uh -huh. look what we got. Mm. This horrible weight of grief. We're going to put it in you, little girl. You're our mm. only child. Uh -huh. So this all gets very subtly communicated in early childhood. Um, mm through how the mother ministers to the child, what's said to the child. And that forms a basic foundation of the self, hmm. which in her case was not so positive. Yeah, okay. And I'm thinking about, I've read about um, like family therapy with people who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia and how the, they have a high, people with schizophrenia who are in like a remission have a higher chance of kind of relapsing if they go back to their family of origin and their family has specific uh, factors at play, like emotional expression, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That makes, yeah, okay. Because yep. now, you would say like a psychotic family. process. Well, yeah, uh, the communication pattern in the family, mm -hmm. unless the whole family is willing to come into treatment and own their responsibility, as mm -hmm. well as the intergenerational pattern, mm -hmm. um, the communication pattern and the way of managing affect mm -hmm. in the family system really probably isn't gonna change. So the person's gonna go back into a mm -hmm. very similar system that may have contributed to the triggering of the psychosis to begin with. Um, yeah. It's so same people in insane places mm -hmm. you can be made insane by uh -huh. an insane place uh -huh. that's so uh yeah it's so complicated because i think of like for instance your patient's mother um i could see how the way that or and father perhaps i don't know the story but i could see how the way that they handled it if they kind of handled it in a way that the daughter felt like it was her burden to bear. And then the daughter ended up having this mental illness as a result. And right. then the parents are kind of, I could see the parents starting to think like, well, 
yeah, like you said, like scapegoating or like, well, she's the one that's in the hospital. She's, she's crazy why can't, why, yeah, she's a crazy person. Why can't you handle this? Like we handled it. We're still, we're fine. We're out of the hospital. Right. And then it's kind of like further, like she's like that. And they like never that. really do handle it because mm. the client is handling it. Uh -huh. And that's very unhealthy for that client. They uh -huh. need to handle their own stuff. Yeah. Um, and they don't even realize that they're not handling it because right. it's like, oh, we're handling it. Look, we're fine. We go to work every day. We Yeah. So she but... becomes a kidney dialysis machine. We'll call it almost an emotional dialysis machine for mm -hmm. her parents' trauma mm -hmm. feeling. Man. Uh, and that could make a person crazy. Yeah. 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 I'm I'm working at a like a short short-term psychiatric hospital right now where they come mm -hmm. meet average average day is about a week mm -hmm. and it's very often that that i hear the client the patient's story and i'm like i would how i would be surprised if you weren't here right now or i'm surprised if you weren't depressed or like it yeah. makes sense why you yeah i know yeah. there are lots of crazy things that go on in families that make mm emotionally sensitive, sometimes high empath people um, huh. not feel so good emotionally. Mm. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's, I think, can we hone on on that for a second? Are there certain personality styles or temperaments that are more likely to be predisposed toward perhaps a psychotic break or, yeah? Well, I think you know, and I, I had to look at the research on this, but um, uh -huh. uh, there's, um, if you look at Dabrowski's um, emotional developmental scale, he has five mm -hmm. levels of emotional development. And mm -hmm. in the West, we really talk only about intelligence, e IQ, not EQ. Uh -huh. Well, uh -huh. you can have a very high IQ, but a very low EQ. So mm -hmm. an EQ level one Jabrowski would be narcissist. I will do whatever I can to get my needs met. And I will go to ruthless levels to do that. Level two, the sheep following the wolf. I'll do whatever I need to do to get my needs met. I'll follow the leader. I'll become delusional if I need to, as long as I can fit with the system. North Korea, you know, even here. Um, but then there are those individuals that break through that and go, wait, 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 this doesn't fit. I can't deal with this. Something's wrong. I have to walk to my own drum and I have to develop my own moral compass and my own sense of self. Now, those people are prone to level threes experience fragmentation, um, uh, positive disintegrations. They're more prone to resonate with compassion, empathy, understanding. And, you know, if not guarded a bit in that process, they can be victim to level ones and level twos. And uh -huh. does that make sense? And we go uh -huh. all the way up to level four and level five, self-actualization, fully developed, self-actualized individuals, compassionate people. Now, the scary thing is, Dan, 70% of the population falls into levels one and two. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, not, not too good. Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. okay, so, okay. Can you tell? The, the empaths might fall into a category if left um, without proper boundaries to be potentially very vulnerable to a world that's fairly toxic. Mm. Uh -huh. That makes sense. Yeah. It's um, a little bit um, disconcerting. Yeah, yeah. Because then, because uh, if you think about it, especially in terms of the family system and you have like the the empath or the, maybe the sensitive, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and the rest of the family, 70% of the family is, 
is at levels one and two, right? Then, as like working within family therapy, how do you? It seems like you'd almost have to bring a level one or two up to a level three in order to start to understand like what the yeah. family member is going through. That and, would be the goal. I'm working with a, a woman now who go a name that just was in a family system, four sibs, well-educated parents. And I'm working with one sibling and the mother. Um, and my client, she was every, no one saw all the abuse in the house, but she sure did. Mm. And had to carry the weight of that all the way to the university. And when she finally got into counseling, went, oh my God, oh. I'm a neglect and abuse survivor. And oh. now trying to get the mother to own responsibility mm. uh -huh. for what she did and the uh -huh. father, which is not the responsibility of child, by the way. If you're yeah. thrown against the wall or, you know, told you're stupid uh -huh. and, you know, these are irresponsible acts that parents across all socioeconomic <gasps> levels make. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you're right. Now, whether this mother will come up to a higher level of understanding, I don't know. Yeah. But at least my client understands she is not to fault. She is not responsible. Good. And yes, yeah. indeed, her mother needs to work on her own self-development as well as her mm -hmm. father. And some of her sins. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Can you, um, I think this is a good segue into, I wanted to hear about the, your, your use of creativity and work. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Can you tell us about that? Well, I've always been a, a very um, big um, proponent of theater, uh, dance, music, mm -hmm. and my, uh, my path into the use of creativity um, started with a creative development group um, mm -hmm. with severely mentally ill adults at Winfield Woods, um, where the group as a whole would um, be given a project such as mandalas, they create symbols of the cell for, uh -huh. um, they would engage in group poetry construction and uh -huh. Through that artistic medium, um, they would we would then create it, but then spend a portion of the group interpreting it and gaining an understanding for what, what this might mean. What does this poem mean? And that little group um, culminated in the formation of a theater group, WinQuest oh. Theater, and we produced The Rite of Spring, which is a ballet on the Champs-Élysées, uh, 1913. Um, Nijinsky, who was schizophrenic, was the choreographer. And um, uh, Stravinsky, Nijinsky, yeah, and Stravinsky was the composer who was bipolar. And that oh. caused a riot on the Champs-Élysées. So I showed it to the group and they were like, let's do it. Ugh. And it, it wasn't the American Ballet Theater, but we did do a show and it was beautifully video graphed and we did take it to Creativity and Madness in Paris. And that led to other shows, The Sound of Music and Mary Poppins and um, wow. really building self-efficacy, sense of, um, of confidence, ego structure in people when given an opportunity could really perform yeah. really beautiful stuff. Wow. That's really, that's really cool. How did you get that uh, approved? You're the director, I, right? I was director <laughs> producer. Um, oh. And my, uh, at the time, my, uh, the nursing home director had her MFA from the art Institute. So oh. we worked oh. hand in hand yeah. and understanding the value of creativity and expressing feelings, thoughts, and mm. fantasies. And it's really quite a beautiful video. All of them are. You have it, you have them on video? Yes, 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 I do. I do. Um, the Rite of Spring, well-produced. Um, actually, we also did the Mind of Lincoln, Brilliance and Melancholy, which um, took Lincoln, who had a severe 
depression, almost catatonic okay. depression. He was in bed for six months. And okay. we did a improvisational piece on that, wow. which was professionally video graphed and um, good old Mary Poppins. And, um, <laughs> and are there DVDs? Yeah. Oh, okay. I can send How do I find them? links yeah, to yeah, yeah. take a look at a couple of them. They're fun. Yeah, that would be neat. Okay. And I interview the, the cast after the performance. So you uh, get a sense of how much they benefited from the action. Yeah. So that was another staying on topic with that, because I'm, I want to continue with this. Um, another quote from the book was how is it's from page 36, but it says portrayals of schizophrenia tend to emphasize hallucinations, delusions, endorse organized speech and behavior. Um, but the most horrifying component of the disorder, however, is perhaps the core component of it, which may be that the sufferer's radical estrangement from her fellow human beings. And so mm -hmm. when thinking about like the extreme isolation, someone like that might feel and feeling estranged from humanity from fellow mm -hmm. human beings mm -hmm. and then getting them together and putting them in a play. That yeah, sounds yeah. amazing. Yeah. Oh, they were fast. I mean, obviously there were insurmountable risks of someone falling, et cetera, but huh. no one did. And everyone, they were like a movie star. Uh, <laughs> one of the cast members said, I'm like a movie star. So, um, cool. so they're, the, the family component here was the performances had about 148 audience attendees, wow. many family members. So they could see their stigmatized family member in a very different light uh, than how they might previously see them. Uh, so suddenly they are Maria in The Sound uh, of Music. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> you know, they're Abraham Lincoln. Um, it, it took them, it, it actually reframed and gave meat to other aspects of who these people were, hmm. other, you know, they were, they were the schizophrenic. Well, they have, they're much more than. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Do, do you, uh, do you know any other programs or hospitals that conduct that type of therapeutic in Europe, probably okay. open dialogue or, you know, in Italy, they use drama therapy, but very differently. I think than this, I, I really don't know of any other, maybe, mm. you know, I, I really don't. Um, yeah. So they've done it with autistic children. I think there was a whole musical on with autistic children, but. Oh. Um, children, uh, but not adults with the severe diagnoses. Yeah. What about even like, even just family therapy? What, what, what percentage of private or state hospitals would you say, take that into consideration? Man. HIPAA. If the person isn't willing to sign a release, you can't even talk to a family member. And without knowledge from the family member, it's pretty hard to treat the individual. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. But the average experience that an individual has in a hospital outside of medication management is useless. Mm. It's isolation in a bed, um, maybe a group. Um, Rarely psychotherapy. Yeah. Yeah. What would you... That, that's, uh, that's in this country. That's in this yeah, country. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What would you consider... Do you have an opinion on if you... Let's say you were in charge for... For like a year. Mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion on what kind of changes you would make to... To better the system, better the hospitals? Well, there has to be more integration of family. There has to be um, peer 
interactions, there have to be really group psychotherapy. Uh. That doesn't just pass, you don't have to pass out forms to fill out, but the <laughs> interactions and what needs to occur in these institutions is a, um, I have a specific term for it, um, peer support, um, creation of mutual relationships, hmm. an environment, a development of a culture of inquiry where curiosity and um, the sharing of power and empathic listening mm. takes place. Mm. I don't think you get a lot of listening in these places. You're uh -huh. talked at. Uh -huh. You're talked at. That, um, to, quote, to quote one more time, I, uh, I found it. I found this very striking. So in uh, on page 26, it says, in a seemingly toxic treatment environment, a single mental health care provider who shows empathy and genuine care for a patient in great emotional distress can make a difference in the patient's recovery. And I, I, there is a, a quote by Carl Jung, actually, and he said that the thing that really matters is the personal commitment, the serious purpose, the devotion, indeed the self-sacrifice of those who give the treatment. I have seen results that were truly miraculous as when sympathetic nurses and laymen were able by their courage and steady devotion to reestablish psychic rapport with their patients and so achieve quite astounding cures. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, yeah, that, that, that's what it made me think of. And the tendency for staff in places like this to already, well, I'm, I'm the doctor, I'm the nurse, I'm the mental health care provider, you're the crazy one, you're the mm -hmm. one with psychosis, you're the one who's borderline, you're the mm -hmm. one with this diagnosis. So, mm -hmm. yeah, just. Well, we as professionals have to be mindful and work with these clients with intention and certainly with hope mm -hmm. and understand that these symptoms that are presented to us are very creative ways in which the mind is defending against something. Uh. And I'm not an expert at, in my client's mind. I want to meet uh. my client where I'm at, where they're, where they're at mm. and will evolve into a sense of understanding about what this thing is. That's uh -huh. part of you. What is this all about? Uh -huh. Not in a threatening, demeaning, stigmatizing way, but in a, a mode of curiosity. Hmm. What is this about you that's so unique? And that's a, uh, a di much different reframe than yeah. giving people ECT. With yeah. No yeah, man. Can you, uh, you've, you mentioned group therapy. You've mentioned Tavistock method. I had never heard about it prior to reading this book. Can you educate us mm -hmm. on the Tavistock method of group therapy. Yeah, very briefly, um, Tavistock is located in London um, huh. and it's a um, center uh, that really is focused on studying human development. Many great thinkers, uh, Winnicott, Klein, Bowlby, studied at the Tavistock Institute. Okay. And Tavistock came to the United States and was enveloped into um, the AK Rice organization. Hmm. Um, and the basic model of Tavistock um, looks at group processes as a function of group as the whole. So if we were in a group and um, there were three other people, you and I, and Dan, you said, I have to leave the room right now. Hmm. I can't stand it. In a traditional group model, that might get interpreted as Dan's issue. Dan uh -huh. has to leave the group um, because of something going on with Dan. In the Tavistock framework, that would be seen as some aspect of every individual in this room wants to leave. And it's mm -hmm. been placed in Dan. Oh. 
and he's leaving on behalf right. of all of those aspects of us that are put into him. And that's the way the consultant, so instead of really, you don't even call them therapists, but consultants consult to the group process, not in a way of pointing out any individual's idiosyncrasies, but oh. noting any idiosyncrasy in the group as a function of the whole group. And what does it mean? What does it mean? And how can the interpretation of these events or experiences in the group lead to growth of the group as a whole? So that's a little bit different model. And the group becomes a breast. I mean, it's a mama. Everybody wants to be at the group. You know, they want it. God, we're not having group. We got to have group. It becomes a safe holding environment. Um, a breast, to use Melanie Klein's ideation, that you you get a good suck. You get a good feel by being with these people week after week after week. And it builds psychic structure and executive functioning. And people find out they're likable and they make friends and they deal with conflict. And those are all good things. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I think that's a very different way to look at it. Yeah. And yeah. I've run all different types of groups. Uh, but the model that we modified um, to fit this, this model is typically for the highly educated non-pathological, but in reality, uh -huh. one out of four people have a mental illness and the other three are lying anyway. So the, uh -huh. <laughs> really not. it works with everybody. That's about it. pretty much everybody. And they get something and out. This, the modified Tavistock model is that uh, what you find perhaps most beneficial or most helpful for working with people diagnosed with psychotic? I think it's a very helpful model. Um, yeah. The practicality of implementing it in the United States, given the rigid boundaries and stereotypical views, you know, I happen uh -huh. to be in a place that was very creative and open to inquiry. Um, uh -huh. But I... I presented the model numerous places and a lot of interest in Europe um, on this modified model. Lots of curiosity about it. Not so much in the United States. Hmm. Um, for someone interested in one day working with um, severe mental illness, Mm -hmm. what, what, where would you, do you have like either a section of the country or a certain uh, institutes or hospitals that you would give your approval, your stamp of approval for? Well, that's a really hard question. Uh -huh. I would move to Norway. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> or Italy. Um, yeah. Well, no, I think, uh, unfortunately, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but right now, uh, since 2015, there's been a 2016, a 30% increase in mental illness in the United States, along with hospitalizations, increased suicides. Um, I, there are not a lot of friendly places to go, um, to oh. be honest with you. Places like um, uh, University of Chicago does a wonderful fellowship in um, that I took part in in uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy um, for a young practitioner like yourself to take part in. Oh. That's a group of people that you can connect with oh. um, that views the world a little differently. Um, the C.G. Young Institute, um, uh, you know, any humanistic Rogerian um, type mm. establishment or theoretical orientation I think would foster better growth in individuals uh -huh. who are going to work with these people or the people themselves. Now, unfortunately, what I'm discovering is, and I'm a retired professor, but most of these programs are not teaching existential psychology. They're not teaching Rogerian. They're not mm -hmm. teaching psychodynamic, maybe one course. 
And yeah. that's a shame. Yeah. It's a shame. But yeah, I don't know of any other way to learn about existential psychotherapy other than like self-study or, or re yeah. Yeah. I was fortunate enough at the time, uh, Gruber McAllister did a wonderful, wonderful course using um, Yellen's book on existentialism. And you know, these are venues that as practitioners, psychology, philosophy, religion, chemistry, alchemy, hmm. literature, they all are part of treatment and young really fostered the introduction of art uh -huh. into treatment and it's it's extremely valuable and a creative approach even in our interpretations of dreams it's all poetry mm -hmm. metaphor. wow very neat is there uh i had two i had two questions do you have do you have a few more minutes i think for a lot of uh my peers and us current students and like we just said, we, we don't really get a course on existential psychotherapy. Um, I think it's a very self-learned topic nowadays. Mm -hmm. And so can you kind of maybe explain the premise behind existential psychotherapy and how you use that, especially in terms of being trauma informed? Well, I think um, if you think about um, anyone's journey mm -hmm. through life, um, we are faced with obstacles and we are faced with some of the fundamental themes of existentialism, hopelessness, death, anxiety, dread. Um, these things are part of the human process um, and they blend very well with many disorders where people may be terrified of life, the future, um, particularly if they come from a background that's just basically uh, embellished in strife, in trauma. Uh -huh. Their whole world is dread. They uh -huh. dread the world. They are hopeless and fear death potentially. So maybe the whole treatment isn't focused on existential psychotherapy, but the themes of existentialism are definitely going to come up mm. in the process. Um, what is the meaning of life? Meaninglessness. What is my purpose? Um, you know, I think R.D. Lang said that, you know, one of the causes of schizophrenia is a sense of meaninglessness and lovelessness. Mm. Um, and we're in a world where I think it's kind of hard to find for some people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you ever, did you ever consider going through the Jungian Institute and becoming certified? as a Jungian analyst? Um, no, 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 that wasn't my path. <laughs> um, my path was uh, uh, as a professor and um, to be analyzed hmm. and to have the lived experience of analysis um, myself and to hmm. embrace the theory. But I don't know if having a badge of certification would have made that much difference. Uh, yeah. We're talking here about intuiting with people and shamanic process and we're, I didn't need another diploma. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think it's wonderful for people who have the energy to do it, but it just wasn't timing wise for me. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, who, so other than Carl Jung, who, and perhaps Yalom with existential therapy, who would you say for someone like me, I'm still in my graduate program, still have a lot mm -hmm. of learning to do. Who would you recommend? Mm -hmm. Like, these are some primary authors I think would be good to read or good to learn about or books. Yeah. Well, I can tell you right now, Bowlby's book, 
classic book on attachment. Okay. Um, Mahler, uh, The Psychological Birth of the Human Infant. Hmm. Winnicott, Reality and Play. These are really classic pieces um, that should be part of any curriculum. Um, there's also Brenner's book on psychoanalysis, very simple little book. Um, the Psychotic Core, Egan. Um, there, um, the Myth of Sanity would be another one um, that's uh, coming out in audio form. Uh, talks okay. about trance states and how people, all of us go in and out of trance states. Mm. Um, those are just a few of the really classical ones yeah. that I think are of tremendous value. Also, okay. I strongly recommend looking into Arnold Mendel's, he was a Jungian analyst who went off and developed his own process psychology, huh. um, which is working with, his, one of his books was Coma, um, People in Altered States and how he uses his techniques to make contact with them, learn from them and help them learn from their experiences. Okay. Um, there's also Gary Prouty who passed away recently, who wrote a book on, he was one of the uh, protégés of Carl Rogers and he, okay. he worked with nonverbal um, individuals that might have schizophrenia oh. and let's say uh, some sort of cognitive disorder. Very uh -huh. interesting story about him, which I can leave you with is in his work with these individuals, um, he basically said, I had a fortunate enough to have a couple sessions with him to training in his method. And he said, what drew him to study um, people who are more or less nonverbal mute with psychotic process and more, mm -hmm. um, had of issues was an experience he had as a young man, a boy, with his little brother who fit this criteria. Uh -huh. And he was walking along with his friend to go fishing and little Mikey was following. And he said, geez, I wish little Mikey would know what we're doing and could participate. And out of the blue, little Mikey said, how do you know I don't? Uh -huh. And then he went right back into the Oh, needless to say, that was his life work. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see why it would be. Oh, I know. Oh. Well, very interesting. Um, okay, well, thank you so much. Is there yeah. uh, is there anything that you would like yeah. to say before uh, we depart? I will just uh, emphasize the need to use cognitive behavioral dialectical behavior therapy and all these wonderful techniques. But judiciously, there are, it's very important to break out of the framework of evidence based because I would flunk out of any cognitive behavioral program <laughs> or not filling out the forms and not be part of the outcome. So yeah. not everybody fits that. And you really have to have an eclectic treatment modality that meets the specific client's needs. Hmm. Thanks a lot okay. for having me. Yeah, it's, it's been a real pleasure. I'm so happy we could finally do this. Yeah, it was a pleasure meeting you.